We have Franco Lofranco with us today. And what we are going to be talking about is legitimately disrupting the healthcare industry. Now, I know a lot of people listening have probably heard that statement before and are saying, all right, Doug, yeah, whatever. But what Franco and I were talking about in the pre-show is really legitimately having a chance to disrupt the healthcare industry, which because what I have observed is that there's this self-reinforcing cycle in place where there is a consistent drive to get people more medicated and consuming more healthcare. And of course, what it's doing is it's making health leavably expensive to where it's effectively out of reach for probably close to half of the population. Most people have some form of coverage, but they truthfully can't afford it or they couldn't afford if something happened to them that was more than very minor. That's one of the problems that Franco is really working to unravel, which I am really excited about because I think healthcare is one of those key areas that there needs to be something very different. And the answer is not to have the government do it because yes, the government can strip the profits out, but you will end up with a system that is even less efficient than what, that will result in costs that are even higher than what we have now. So anyway, Franco, take it away. I don't want to talk this whole time. Oh, I love it, Doug. First of all, I'm honored to be on your show. Big fan and love what you guys are doing. And thank you. I grew up in Canada. So uh -huh. I was born and raised there before I came to live in the US. And so I have a great experience with the Canadian healthcare system. Uh -huh. Some people think it's good, which I can tell you, I'm not a fan of, to be honest, having experienced both in Canada, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of the quality. I'm not a fan of the availability. I'm not a fan of a lot of it. And so I would take the U.S. healthcare system in a heartbeat. Not to say that it doesn't have a lot of, it's got a ton of issues. The problem yeah. is, how do we make the U.S. system more efficient? How do we make it better? How to make it more affordable for people, mm -hmm. giving them better coverage, more peace of mind, and less stress. Yeah. We know the number one source of bankruptcy in the U.S. is healthcare for people. So if we can do that and find a solution for them, and that's what we think we found, yeah. a health sharing platform we're able to allow. I remember when the Affordable Care Act conversations were going on with President Obama back in 2009, a genius solution to the healthcare crisis was to force people to buy insurance. I'm like, this is the best you can come up with is we're going to force people to buy insurance. And there were no conservatives involved in this at all, because at the time, the presidency, the U.S. House and U.S. Senate were all controlled by the Democrat Party. And again, let's go forward, because that was obviously a, a biblical boondoggle. Well, you got to remember, the insurance industry has a huge lobby ad for what? that. So <laughs> if they can force everybody to take their product, hey, yeah. why not? And that was really the plan. It made no sense. And a lot of the plans even affordable. So thank God in 2019 that that yeah. ended. Let's just kind of through some of the things that your company and your group is doing to crack this nut, because I think this is probably one of the more meaningful problems to society and humanity at large in the current era. Medical debt is the leading cause of bankruptcy. And by medical debt, what I'm talking about is that if you end up having to go to the hospital and you can't pay the bill, then what ends up happening is it goes into collections and you get a judgment levied against you. Now what ends up happening is if you have a tax return, it ends up having to go to pay that judgment. You can get your wages garnished. And so what a lot of people end up doing is they end up needing to file bankruptcy in order to wipe away that medical debt judgment well, what that does is that restricts their access to credit for seven-ish years, or at least restricts their access to good credit. So I have a whole bunch of people who, through no fault of their own, incurred medical expenses that resulted in them essentially needing to destroy their financial life, thus inhibiting their ability to become affluent. If I didn't know better, I would almost think it was designed to keep people poor. I don't think it was designed that way, but that's been the effect. Well, I would say it's designed to keep people, the people that provide it rich, They're, but the result is the same. It impoverishes people and keeps the wealthy wealthy, which is, look, God bless them. They want to do that. But if, if we can provide a better solution, then let's do that. You're saying God bless them. They're trying to make money, but there's a really important difference is that if you are pursuing money without providing value, that is fundamentally unethical. In my view, the pursuit of money without value is how we got crypto. At the time of this recording, we're less than a month a way out of the FTX implosion, where we basically found out that nobody around there knew anything about accounting, about risk, apparently about how to clear trades or how to properly, <laughs> properly account for customer funds. You know, more or less, there was just capital that flooded in because people saw this enormous bubble and they wanted to be there for the ride. And the people who were running it really had no clue of what they were doing whatsoever and nobody vetted them out. This is what happens when you pursue money without regard to value. 
That's incredible. Yeah, that was a, a mind blowing story. That's why we we set up the company was set up as a nonprofit. And the reason why I say the nonprofit because when you take the profit out of healthcare, all that stuff goes away, and then all we all there, there is is to provide value to members. Yes. And so we set up the company as a health sharing platform. For those of you not familiar with health sharing, it goes back to the Christian roots year decades ago. There are already millions of people using that platform today, based with churches. But if you weren't Christian and didn't follow the Christian ways, then you couldn't get that healthcare. So we decided yeah. to do it ethics based. So it's based on the Christian principles, but we're ethics based. So just you're promising to be a good person, to be an ethical person in your life. And if you do that, you're able to get our healthcare coverage, which on average saves people 50 to 70% on their healthcare costs. I want to stop you for just a second because there's a really important thing you just said, which is that. Because by making this ethics based, what that does is now you can intercept pot, you know, you can intercept historically more vulnerable populations that would be either transient populations or LGBTQ, BIPOC, et cetera, who historically have had much lower rates of care and coverage. Exactly. And we are also the first healthcare company in history to provide healthcare to Americans or not Americans, migrants or individuals that are here that don't have a U.S. social yet. So right now they can't get covered. So if you're from three countries, Mexico, Guatemala, and Canada, and you're living in the U.S. and you don't have a U.S. social yet, because we allow these people to come into the country, which is great, but then we say, good luck to you. You're on your own. We're not going to give you health care and we're not going to give you a job. You can't work. Like, what are you doing here? Like, I don't understand. Like, why are you waiting? Well, at least help us help them. We don't, yeah, give, right. we don't give them permits. We don't give them anything. It's like, you yeah. come in here, but you can't work and you can't get health care. I'm like, well, that's nice of you. You're like, born on the wrong side of a line. Go away. Yeah. Anyway, there's millions and millions of old people that now, thanks to what we're doing, can now get health care through us. So we're very excited. But it's the same plans. Everybody else can get the same pricing. No different. And it's really exciting. So that's really good. And how we do it is with a patented technology. We're member to member, peer to peer. It's no different than our crypto works. We create yeah. a decentralized platform. So how it works is you put your money into a digital wallet, your wallet, and you put your money in there. And we're completely transparent. So you have a portal you log into, and you can see exactly your money, what it's doing, and where the money goes every month. So if, for example, somebody, one of the members needs money because they got into an accident or something major happens and need an operation, then here's where the algorithm comes in. You have an algorithm that comes in, knows exactly how much you take from each member, uh -huh. balances the wallets, and it's patent for us alone. It's really cool. And that allows us to take uh, it makes us very efficient as to how much to pay folks. So that's a great way to keep costs down and to do this all through member to member, peer to peer technology, which is a bit a boondoggle. On top of that, we allow members to pick their own doctor or hospital in the country. It doesn't make sense to me why that's limited. You should be able to pick whatever doctor or hospital you want. Plus, we allow you to have your own 24 seven telehealth. So let's say you come okay. to a doctor, you're busy. Well, you go on the portal, you book an appointment with a doctor. I did it a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't feeling well. I got on there. I got a call within two hours. Doctor comes on there. Oh, you got this. Great. I'm going to send you some drugs. Sends it over to my pharmacy. Boom, I'm done. Uh -huh. You could do that 24 7 for free. So not only saving people money, we're also getting them better coverage, more convenience, ridiculous prescription drug pricing. I haven't seen less by anybody. They're pretty amazing. And you get a free annual. You get free blood yeah. work once a year. Why? To prevent. Like, yeah. wh why not help prevent people? So a lot of times people don't go to the doctor because they're scared to spend the money. Well, if you get a free one once a year yeah. and you get free blood work once a year, then hopefully you'll go. And, and then if you can prevent it, hey, we'll make a healthier society and help people out. And it's just part of how we give back. I want to unpack how it is that you can have more choice and lower costs. I think I know the answer. Why don't we play the same game that we did in the, in the pre-show, yeah. which is where I'll tell you what I think and you tell me how I'm wrong. Or how you're right. How you're right. Yeah, yeah, okay, we can do it that way too. <laughs> the way that the traditional models work is that there will usually be pre-negotiated rates and then what ends up happening is claims have to be approved. So in other words, it'll be a pre-negotiated reimbursement rate, which usually is not as high as the retail rate for the doctor. So they end up making less money on insurance patients, but it's higher volume. So they accept it anyway. And so then what ends up happening is you have care, the doctor makes a claim, the claim gets approved or, de approved or denied, and the claim gets paid. And there's different rates for in-network versus out-of-network. Now, I think the thing that is easy to miss is that there is overhead associated with all of these processes. Every time a claim has to be is submitted, there's overhead associated with that. Every time it's reviewed, overhead associated with that. 
every time that it has to be approved or denied, every time it has to be reintroduced, every time it has to be re-reviewed, there's overhead associated with all of these processes. And the, the thing it feels like you, you might just be doing is saying, hey, if we reduce these layers of overhead, you can approve higher rates of reimbursement and put more flexibility in the amount of claims that you approve because you don't have to pay for all these layers of review. Did I get it close or am I missing something? That's one major portion for sure. There's right. four things that make us most costly and can save people half price. Number one is we're nonprofit. So the minute you take the profit away, like you know, with a, one of these big insurance companies, mm -hmm. they gotta make a profit. It makes them do weird things. So let me give you an example. Doctors and hospitals hate insurance companies. Uh -huh. Why? Because in a lot of cases, they'll pay in two to six months because they hold on to that money and they'll do things with that money instead of paying them because we're talking a lot of money. Well, we pay on average in 10 days. So right away, you go in there, maybe we pay them right away. They're like, there's no waiting for them. They're like, oh, we love you because they want to get paid. A friend of mine was telling me a story about his, his dad. His dad was an orthopedic surgeon. He mm -hmm. retired about a year ago. He's still getting paid from cases before he yeah. retired that the insurance company still hasn't been paid out. I'm like, that's insane. It's funny because his son told me, because if they would have known about you, he would have maybe wouldn't have retired. He would have yeah. kept working, but he just got time. And that's the second part, which is doctors and they're fighting with the insurance companies for payments. But here's what we know. There's a rate card in every state. So every state has a rate card for what a service costs. It's actually pretty clear. It shouldn't be a fight. So basically yeah. we go and we say, all right, what's the service? Okay. Based on the state, here it is. And 98% of the time, they'll agree. We, we release the funds within 10 days. The hospital doctor gets paid and they're very happy. Now, 2% they're going to argue, well, I'm a specialist and I'm different and I'm unique. So they'll fight you on it. But, you know, we almost resolve every single case all the time. So that's not typically a problem. The third thing is our technology, which allows us to eyes all the money in the accounts and rebalance it in such a way that it is totally good. For example, in my account, my money's still in there. Do you know that if I decided to leave the healthcare company right now, which I wouldn't, but if I did, the money that's left, I think with me. It's portable. But imagine if you're with an insurance company and you pay them in the month, that money's gone. So that's another problem. And then the fourth one really is to what you said, which is we're pretty, we're now being considered the Uber of healthcare. So we're very lean, very efficient, all virtual, all tech. And so minimal people in So as a result of everything, we're able to save individuals, families, and companies a ton of money right now. All right. So we just walked through how we're able to bend that curve. I'd like to walk through a little bit of what does that mean? What's the impact going to be to the people who are either the small businesses or even big businesses or just the individuals? What have you seen as some of those impacts? Good, that's a great question. So. First of all, we want to give people, be able to get coverage. A lot of people want coverage. They can't afford it. So now that yeah. we can do it, one of the things that gives people is tremendous peace of mind. They feel that they're, they're already stressed enough with everything that's going on. Like imagine being a father or a mother and you've got children and you can't provide healthcare because you can't afford it, but now you can. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. I'll give you another example. Even if you work for a company, a lot of companies make you pay for healthcare. I'm looking at a company right now where the employee portion is more than our whole planet. Just the employee portion. So they're opting out of their own company yeah. just to take our plan directly because it's going to save them $150 a month, which to them for a family of five is a big deal. And for us, if you've got three or more in the family, the price is the same. You can have five kids, six kids, seven kids. We don't yeah. care. It doesn't matter to us. So long term, what he's doing is giving people peace of mind. It feels like they're taking care of their family and care of themselves. They can go out there and live a life. They're not scared. Oh my God, what if I get to an accident? What if I get hurt? It's making a big deal. And I believe it makes people more productive in society. A lot of times people are in a job they hate for so the healthcare. No other reason. So now, hey, maybe you can get a healthcare that's affordable. Go to what you love. Maybe start a company. Do something that's going to, you know, make a difference in the world or in your life that you're passionate about instead of working for a company that maybe you care less about. And the only reason why you're there yeah. is for the healthcare. That's ex precisely what I was thinking about because in April of 2020, I was separated from my corporate job and I was immediately introduced to the looking for healthcare boondoggle, particularly because in 2020, there were a whole bunch of other people who were unemployed at the same time. So every job that I applied for also had a hundred plus other applicants. So what ends up happening is that you have this weird dichotomy where the options that are available, if you want to do your own thing are terrible, the non-corporate healthcare options are awful. <laughs> They're either horribly expensive, or you have very little in the way of coverage, help, whatever. Or if you decide you want to pay for Cobra, which you usually only have for a couple of months, 
and it's horridly expensive, but you only have, you have a pretty short window before you have to get into some other job. Otherwise you have to figure out how to pay for your own healthcare. So what that, what it does is it creates this artificially short job search window for people who end up getting separated, which right now, a lot of corporations are going through a series of layoffs. There's a lot of people hitting the street and this is a big deal because otherwise you either have to jump for the first opportunity you can that has, that has healthcare, which in a lot of cases, unfortunately involves going to work for some soulless company, or you have to float the cost yourself, or you have to go uncovered. None of those are great options. I agree hundred percent. And that's the problem, right? I don't know if you know, 5% of Americans are responsible for over half all the healthcare yep. costs in the country. Yep. So for us, those people, for us are non starter. Okay. They okay. will stay with their insurance company, pay what they're working for, and it's up to them to get to where they need to get to. So for us, we have conditions under which we'll accept you, which I think now it's like 70 or 80% do qualify for uh -huh. a lot of people that we can get a goal of life. And then if you do have pre-existing condition, there's a way that if, as you get better and you can transition into a healthcare. But even if you have pre-existing conditions, we do have people that take our healthcare because for everything else they can use it for. Yeah. So for example, we had one person who's got type one diabetes, which has a pre-existing condition, which we're not going to cover when they go to the doctor. Well, the prescription they got to take with us was way less than what they were paying. So it made it worth it for them to take it and for everything else they may, have, they may encounter. I'll give another example. One of my friends, I was talking to him yesterday. He unfortunately had a DUI almost five years ago, but because it's less than five years, insurance companies want to share. But you know, he's a different person today. The underwriting models that a lot of companies use just baffle me. To me, it's heartless, to be honest. It's about the bottom line to your point at the beginning. And it's, so that's why we're ethic. We're proud of that, that we can do that and provide something that truly matters. The thing that kind of really ignites me about this is that I see something like this as helping to address a major hurdle to more entrepreneurship, which I personally think is probably is the wave of the future. You're starting to see a lot of these corporate hierarchies that are really starting to implode. The federal government's $30 trillion in debt. So figure there's some kind of reckoning coming at some point. And the old structures are rapidly falling apart. As I've gotten older, I've become less and less and less politically interested. In my youth, since my background is financing, I'm a left brain kind of guy, I tend to skew conservative. I'm libertarian now, but that's really beside the point. I remember in 2004, I was all excited because I was like, we have a Republican president, Republican house, Republican Senate, good stuff's going to happen. What happened? A whole bunch of money got spent on the military, a whole bunch of tax breaks passed for energy companies. And I'm like, what? Oh, it doesn't make a difference who is in charge. No. And that's the why it's up to us. If we're going to make an impact, it's got to be up to us and we got to do that. If we expect yeah. politicians doing anything for us, we'll be waiting forever. You could be it's waiting a have... really, really long yeah. time. Beyond our lifetime. We need to schedule a second part. This is a lot of fun. Okay. Before we get to the end, let me ask, is there a question I should have asked that I didn't? Oh, look at that. That's very in depth. Yeah. What should people be doing in the modern economy today? Today we're in a different kind okay. of economy. Than Lay it on me. So if you look at the modern economy today, it's very different than pre-pandemic. I look at the world pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Today, people, by getting out of the rat race for, even for a little bit, for a year or two, they've, they've realized there's got to be a better way to live life and I'm enjoying my freedom. So people are looking for different ways to make money. That's another reason why people can't, companies can't find employees because so many people are doing so many different things. And so in the modern economy today, there's a couple of things that I think are important. Number one, people want a income that's residual in nature. So you always want to find something that's residual where you don't look once, but you get paid over and over and over and again. That's, that, that's what allows you to enjoy your life. That's what allows you to travel, mm -hmm. fun, all those things. And whatever that is bringing meaningful value to your point you said earlier to people. So it's not just about selling some water bottle or whatever yeah. you're selling. What meaningful thing that gives you fulfillment? At the end of the day, it's great that you're making money, but are you truly making a difference in society that every yep. day you love to do. And then yes. third, it's about your own leadership and personal growth and development. What are you doing every day to develop yourself? What are you doing every day to become more self-aware? Because one thing I've learned is the more self-aware you are, A, the more success you can attract because the more people want to be with you, more people want to be hanging around you. 
and more fun becomes, a more fun life becomes. So the modern economy, those are the three things we're looking at today yeah. is, okay, what residual income business can we get into? Second is what meaningful thing can we provide? And third, what do I need to develop in myself where I can grow and get to the next level based on my personal growth and development? Yeah. And there's a really important piece that I want to append on to what you said, which you're talking about the residual income side is that, and that is that if you develop something that you can do from wherever you want for as long as you want, retirement isn't so much of a thing. In other words, it, you know, if you develop something that can work around whatever your lifestyle happens to be, the old model of pile up as much money as you possibly can while you're in your career so that when you inevitably get fired or forced to retire, that you won't have to live in poverty. What you were just talking about, it kind of makes that model unnecessary. Now, there's a bridge that needs to happen because getting to that residual point usually doesn't happen immediately. But once you cross that divide, here's what happens. You're going to be doing what you love and getting paid residual income. So what is there retire for? Like, I'm loving what I do. I'm loving helping people make a difference and my income is residual. Why would I stop? It makes yeah. no sense. And you could take time off if you want, take a month off, take two months off. Totally up to you. I, I took a whole year off. I want to learn how to fly and become a pilot. That's what uh, I do. This has been a lot of fun. Give me your last one to two thoughts and then let everybody know where they can learn a little more about Franco. Sure. Last one or two thoughts. Here's what I would say. In today's world, social media force yourself to spend as little time on there as possible. Use it to make money. If it's not making you money, like stop interacting, stop engaging. Yeah, create, and, don't uh, consume. There's a reason why the executives of Facebook don't let their kids use Facebook. They understand how the algorithms work and uh, where people can reach me on Instagram at Chav Franco, C-A-V-F-R-A-N-C-O, or on my LinkedIn, feel free to message me or reach out. I'm happy to converse and help people anytime. This, this has been a lot of fun. All right, Franco, really appreciate it. Let's do this again soon.